Okay, so the, the title of the talk is The Oldest Postmistress in Britain, and it's about work and age in the Victorian post office. Um, that's me, and this is uh, Addressing Health. The, <clears throat> the work that we're doing is part of a, a big project which is funded by the Wellcome Trust. We started in December 2019, um, so we've only, we're only just over a year old or so. Um, the aim of the project is to try and understand uh, health and uh, ill health in the workplace in Victorian and Edwardian Britain. And we're using the post office as a case study. Um, I'll explain why we're using the case, uh, that as a case study. We've got several partners. Um, I'm from King's College, but we have all my collaborators, uh, Nicola Shelton from UCL, Doug Brown and Harry Smith from Kingston University, uh, Kathleen McElvenna from the University of Derby, um, and we also have Laura Newman, who's another of my colleagues at King's. And we have two PhD students, Natasha Prieger and Holly Marley. So there's quite a big team. They're all working incredibly hard. We work in conjunction with the Postal Museum, which is in Clerkenwell, which unfortunately it really has been closed ever since the first lockdown in March. Um, so we, we've we struggled to get back into the archives and we found all sorts of uh, ingenious ways of getting around that problem, which I'll show you um, a bit later. So this is our project. Um, I'll come back to, the, to this at the very end with our website address. Um, and we're always putting information on there. We're always, we're always active. We never sit still. Well, here's the post office. Uh, this is the general post office in St. Martin Le Grand, right in the center of the city of London. Uh, you can see St. Paul's in the background. It was an incredibly important institution in Victorian uh, Britain, as it still is today. Um, it had an enormous workforce. It was the, one of the largest employers in the country. It had over 167,000 workers in 1900 and one in five of those were women. And it had a range of occupations which spanned from the lowly letter carrier and sorters all the way up to the postmaster general. It, um, although it was focused in London, um, about a third of the mail came through the city, there were post offices all around the country in all the major cities, as far um, uh, to the very north of Scotland, down to the uh, Cornwall, Land's End and of course all the way through Ireland which was part of the UK at this time. The map on the right shows you um, the location of those post offices and it actually um, also shows you the extent of sickness rates um, but that's a, a, another story for another time. Um, the information from this map actually came from some, some transcriptions that uh, U3A volunteers and Postal Museum volunteers um, did a few, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so it's a very large workforce, it's national, it has um, a range of occupations, it has men and women working in there. Um, so it's a really great case study if you want to study national patterns and compare one group of workers in one area with another, which is part of the, the project that we're involved with. And the reason why we're focusing on sickness in the project is because actually we don't know that much about it. We know a lot about health, or ill health, but only through the death registers and the Registrar General's reports. But we don't actually know what people were living with um, as opposed to what they died from. And so what we're able to do with the records that we've got, and I'll give you an example of that a bit later, is we can actually look at how sick workers were in the 10 years before they retired, the reason why they retired, um, uh, which includes ill health and sometimes gives the diagnosis of ill health. And we can also track them through all the way through to their death to see how long do they live um, after they, they were forced to leave work. And to do this, we rely on a set of records, the pension records from the post office, which are tucked away in the Postal Museum. We haven't been able to get access to them, but we found ways around that. So this is why the post office is a good case study 
to study uh, sickness um, and um, ill health in the workforce over this long period. Okay. Well, over time, the number of post offices grew substantially as the volume of mail did. So our project goes from around about 1858 here all the way up to 1908, which is slightly off this graph. We have this 50 year period because the records that we rely on are consistent in that period. So um, it, it's a nice frame to, to look at change. It's also a very important change in patterns of ill health as we shifted away from infectious disease towards the um, more chronic conditions associated with an aging population. But of course, now with COVID, we've shifting back towards the impact of an infectious disease again. So we're almost going back to the Victorian period where the majority of disease of deaths arose because of infectious type diseases. Back to the number of post offices. Um, the number of post offices rose from around about 10,000 in 1854 up to around 20,000 uh, dotted around the country. In some cases such as this, which is Wyndham's post office in 1903, it's, they're very small, they're linked up to um, a general store or often a stationer's. Um, and they go right the way up to St. Martin Le Grand and the main general post office and all sizes in between. You have men and women running these. I suspect that one of these, probably this woman here, was the shopkeeper, but was she also the sub postmistress or the postmistress as well? We'll come on to these postmistresses later. Um, the general store sign is here, but the post office sign is up here. Um, so this is typical of many of the little post offices dotted around the country um, where the female or male postmasters were very important parts of the community. And just to show you again where those, uh, if we plot from um, our data where all those postmasters and postmistresses uh, were postmistresses and sub postmistresses, you can see they're all the way from down here in Penzance, down in the, um, well, in the far southwest of the country, all the way up to the north of Scotland and all around um, Ireland. These are the female postmistresses and sub postmistresses, um, and you often find these in quite isolated areas, rural areas um, of the country. Well, let me introduce you to some of them. And these are three people that I'd like to introduce you to. Uh, all women who worked for the post office and had long working lives. The first on the left is Elizabeth Adamson. She worked in, um, up in Scotland. The middle one is Jane Smith. She worked down in the Southwest in Devon in Holdsworthy. And the one on the right is Hannah Brewer. And I have to thank um, Richard Capon for drawing my attention to the book where uh, Hannah's story um, was first told. She worked in uh, Bitten. She was known as the Bitten Postwoman. Uh, that's in South Gloucestershire. Let me tell you a little bit about these three. This is Elizabeth Adamson. Um, she, in February 1898, she was visited by a reporter from the Dundee Courier who told her story. Um, she worked for 58 years as a postmistress of, and I'm going to try and pronounce this, Achmithi, on the east coast of Scotland. And as the reporter said, she was blessed with a cheery old body, a clear memory, and in spite of her remarkable age, she was 93 um, when she was being um, in... <coughs> Uh, interviewed, she had excellent eyesight um, and she could recall, clearly she had all her wits about her, she could recall the Battle of Waterloo in 18, I think it was 1805, 1815 was it, I can't remember the exact date, coronation of Queen Victoria in 1837 and of course travelling on the new railway. 
Um, in that year that she actually retired, she received a gratuity from um, the royal bounty. Um, sadly, she died three months later, so she didn't live very long to enjoy it. Although she's in her 90s and was probably the oldest postmistress at the time, she was not alone. This is Jane Smith. Um, she was celebrated um, with a portrait in what was a post office museum, which was a room in the general post office. Um, and there you can see her, she's holding her parcels and she was an auxiliary post woman. She actually delivered the mail. Um, she, she was age 74 at the time this photograph was taken. And by then she served around about 20 years walking 10 miles a day, delivering her round. If any of you know Devon, you'll know there's lots of hills there. Um, she must have been pretty fit. Well, she was married to an agricultural labourer, John Smith. She had three children and she was recorded in the census of 1881 as a postwoman. Um, in 1901, age 79, she'd retired. She was still married um, and she had a, um, one of her daughters living with her. But she was one of these very long lived post women in, in one of these rural areas um, taking care of the mail. And this is Hannah Brewer. Um, this comes from a, a book on the Bristol Royal Mail. Hannah Brewer started delivering letters as a child. Her father was the sub postmaster of the village of Bitten, and she continued to deliver letters until she reached the age of 72. So she was probably working for 50 or 60 years. Um, her round was 11 miles a day. And it was said to have several steep hills. And I was curious what were the, I've not been to this part of the world, so I've got the map um, and I believe me, and I'll show you in a minute, she certainly did have to uh, walk up some hills. In total, it was said that she, she walked around about a quarter of a million miles delivering the mail. Um, and she was supposed to be the recipient of the first official waterproof clothing uh, issued to post women in England. And she's shown wearing this in this rather um, in, in um, uh, uh, rather unclear photograph. It's the best that we've got of her. Uh, but as uh, Mr. Toombs, the postmaster at Bristol said, she rarely ventured far and was as a rule of stay at home. She was not a great reader of the newspapers. But persons on around looked at her as an oracle and derived information from her as to passing events. So again, a sense of the importance of these uh, these post women and post mistresses uh, and the lo their longevity, which was the thing that really struck me. Well, this is uh, this is the village of Bitten. There is Hannah, and if you look closely, um, the post office was somewhere in the village here. Um, there's Bitten Hill. Um, there's another hill, all of these little farms dotted around. She would have to walk up from Bitten, which was in the valley, up to these farms. Uh, there's Hanging Hill, um, Lansdowne Hill and Farn Hill. So all the way around, Bitten is surrounded by hills. So her 11 miles was probably quite a feat, um, a physical feat. Well, was she alone? Were these three unusual? Um, and what was it like to work in a post office, in a, in, in a small post office in the countryside? Well, you can't do better than read Flora Thompson's Lark Rise to Candleford. And I'm sure many of you know the book well. Flora herself was a young post office learner in the village of Fringford, which was um, she renamed Candleford in her book, which was run by Miss Lane who was uh, in real life was a woman called Kezia Witten. This is the post office. There was a smithy at one end, a post office at another. Um, I, who knows uh, whether one of these is Flora Thompson or Miss Lane, difficult to tell at this distance. And this is the Shringford map. There's the post office there. Um, in, so this was a time that, that Flora might well have been in this area. And she talks about what it was like to work in a post office. She talks about the delivery of mail, the arrival of mail, the gossip that went on and the knowledge that the postmistresses had of all the goings on in the village 
with the relatives and, uh, and the news of the time. So these were very important parts of village life and the postmistresses and postwomen were very important persons in the community. And to give you a sense of that importance, uh, I pulled up a record of a woman called Mrs. Elizabeth George. She was the postmistress of Tewkesbury. And when she retired, the Tewkesbury Register noted that she had a presentation made because of the esteem in which she was held. And she was given a diamond and sapphire ring, which had been su subscribed to by 58 grateful residents. Well, Elizabeth George appears in the records that our wonderful U3A transcribers have been transcribing for us. This is her pension entry in the index. It appears in volume 82, 182. Uh, she retired on October the 6th. There is her name. There's the abbreviation postmistress. There's her place. And this is the page in the volume. And if we went to the page in the volume of these records, we would find her, her full pension register. Before we look at that, very simply, this is a timeline. She was described as the postmistress's wife. Her husband was in fact the postmaster, but he had a riding accident on his way back from visiting some of the sub post offices in his district. Um, she was uninjured. It was a cart that overturned. Um, he broke his skull and died. She took over the post office and she continued there until 1899, when she retired at the age of 72, having served 40 years in the post office. So she could get a full pension. Um, and that's why she was entered in this book as one of the post office pensioners. And this is her record. These are the records that we're using to get at ill health because they record not just the name of the person, how much they earn, what job they did, where they did it, the length of service. It also lists their sickness record and it lists the reason for retirement, which included ill health and usually a diagnosis of ill health made by one of the post office doctors. If we look at her record a little bit closer, this is her sickness record. These are for the 10 years before she retired. She had ordinary leave, which was her holiday, paid holiday, but she had virtually no sickness. She was a healthy so-and-so except for 1896, when she had 34 days of ill health. Other than that, she had a perfect record of health. Now we can put all of this information together and we can start building up a sense of what were the, sick, what were the years of sickness? How many years, uh, how many days off on average would a post mistress have compared to say a post man or a post woman? What about the indoor sorters? worked in crowded cramped offices or the telegraphists how sick were they how did they survive did they serve 40 years and retire with a full pension or were they forced to retire early and if so with for what reason well we can start to put this information together And this is what I'm going to show in the next few slides. We can compare one group of workers with another. So in this slide, I'm comparing postmistresses shown here for England and Wales, for Ireland in green, and for Scotland, because we know where they worked, we can break it down to the exact place. This is when they started work. We know that, um, we know their age because from the pension records, we know how long they served the post office and we know the year in which they retired. So we can work backwards to find out when they actually started work. So for postmistresses, typically they started work in their early 30s. For other female workers, and most of these would be clerks and telegraphists. 
they started work much early, usually in their early 20s or in the case of uh, Scotland and Ireland, a little bit later. We can also look at the age at which they retired. So postmistress, postmistresses um, uh, retired usually into their 60s. So they had a good 30 years of working life on average wherever they, uh, it, it, wherever they were in the UK. The other female workers didn't fare so well. They tended to retire in their 40s or in their 50s. So they had a much shorter working life. Of course, many of these early workers would have married. But we can take those out of our sample, which we've done here. So these refer to people who remain single um, throughout their working lives. And we can also track them through to their death as we, we have that information um, for many of these workers. And you can see again, postmistresses tended to survive well into their 70s, up here, whereas workers in other occupations tended to survive into their 50s if they were lucky into their 60s. So they on average died around about 10 years earlier than the postmistresses. So we have an age gradient. Postmistresses lived longer, they started work later, they retired later, and they lived longer than did other female workers. And when we start putting that together with all the workforce, we see that that pattern was actually fairly consistent. We've managed to match up around about four four and a half thousand workers so far through a combination of um, parliamentary papers and an index that the U3A transcribers have been putting together. The parliamentary papers that we're using are published online and they contain just the name of the person, the date, the reason why they retired and their age. So we can, we can use this information to look at the workforce as a whole. Each of these people had an individual record, but we can't access them because of COVID. So we've had to rely on other sources. We've got around about 4,000 records of individuals that we, we can trace at present. And don't forget, we've only been going a year we think there are around about 25 or 30,000 of these individuals that we'll be able to track down by the time we finish our project. Well, uh, sorry. Uh, these are our postmistresses here. The dark bar shows you when they retired. The light bar shows you, the yellow bar shows you when they died. Again, they retired in their 60s, they died in their 70s, but they were similar to postmasters, sub postmasters up here. Again, they retired late and they died almost when they got into their 80s. Or the inspector of letter carriers, quite a high status job. They retired a bit earlier, but they lived a good long life well into their 70s. If you were fortunate enough to be a rural letter carrier or a rural messenger, you also had a good long life and you probably had a good working life all the way up to 60. So on this side of the graph are those long lived post office workers. On the right hand side of the graph are those that didn't make it through. The sorters who generally retired in their 40s and only lived into their 50s or the postman. These were mostly town postmen um, delivering the mail in large cities and London. Again, they survived usually up for, uh, in terms of work till their 50s and they died in their mid 50s. So you have a, a sometimes almost a 20 year gradient between these lower paid jobs indoors and in cities compared to the outdoor rural letter carriers and the higher status jobs, such as the postmasters and postmistresses. So work was clearly an important element in explaining 
these differentials. Once we have all our records together, we'll be able to compare postmen in one part of the country to another, as well as between different occupations. Well, let me bring up the final graph. Uh, not quite the final graph, one, there's one more after this. This is the most complex, and I'd just like to explain it a little bit. If we look at different kinds of workers, here are our postmasters and sub-postmasters, here are our postmistresses and sub-postmistresses. These are our sorters and these are our postmen. The, the lines show you the percentage of the workforce and here it shows you their age. Going from 15 all the way up to beyond 85. If you look at the postman graph for a minute, 50% of postmen, which is shown here in this dark, darker area, were aged below 34 years old. 90% of postmen were aged below 55 years old. So virtually none of them made it past the age of 55. Sorters were even, um, had an even worse time of it. 50% of sorters were aged below 34 and 90% of sorters were aged below 45. In other words, they, they rarely worked beyond the age of, 50, uh, of, of 45 years old. They were forced to retire. And most of the reason for that was ill health, as we see in a minute. Compare that to postmasters and postmistresses. Here are the postmasters. And we'll just look at the 90%. 90% of postmasters made it up to the age of 64. So they were working well into their 60s. Most of them were working well into their 60s. 90% made it to the age of 54, uh, of uh, 64. And postmistresses, again, 90% of postmistresses um, uh, would have made it to the age of 62 or thereabouts. So clearly being a postmaster or postmistress was much better if you could do it than being a, a postman and uh, particularly being a sorter. And we can look at this just a little bit more in this last graph. So we've taken around about 4,000 workers between 1860 and 1898, and we've looked at their average age of retirement, and we've looked at the cause of retirement. And I've just picked out the cause as of ill health here. On average, postmasters retired around about the age of mid 60s, as I said, but only around about 18% thereabouts retired because of ill health. Postmistresses, roughly the same, a little bit more ill health, but made it all the way up into their 60s in general. Look at the bottom part of this graph, the right hand side. Here is our postman. They just about make it into their 50s, but around about 60% of them, 65%, retire because of ill health. We get this from the records, the pension records. And if you were a sorting clerk down here, these are the people who work indoors doing shift work at night in very poorly lit and poorly ventilated offices. Many of these would have been in the major towns and particularly London. If you were a sorting or a sorting clerk, 90% of, of these workers retired because of ill health. And if you were a telegraphist, you very rarely made it beyond the age of 40. And almost always you retired because you were sick. And this was, this sickness was always certified by a medical doctor employed by the post office. So 97% of our 
telegraphists in our current sample retired because of health reasons. This is really the first time we get a sense of how health impacted on different workforces in different parts of the country. And what happened to these people after they died? How long did they live? Was their pension sufficient to keep them going? Or did they have to take on extra work that they could do even though they were incapacitated from post office work? And that's something that we will be finding out as well as the project progresses. So just to bring all of this to a close, um, working for the post offices had many benefits. There was regular work, there was free medical assistance, there was a medical service that was set up specifically to look after the workforce. When they went off sick, they got sick pay, which was why it was recorded so carefully. And they also got a pension if they'd worked in the post office for at least 10 years. If they managed to make it through to 40 years, their pension was equivalent to half pay. It was a final salary um, scheme and uh, it, was, it was a good scheme. So most workers would have tried to work for as long as they possibly could um, uh, to get their full pension. But it was clear that conditions of work varied enormously between those very small post offices in rural, account, uh, uh, rural parts of the world like um, Bitton or um, Holsworthy or up in Scotland um, and many of the workers there lived long and healthy lives um, certainly compared to the much more cramped poor uh, conditions that sorters um, had, to, had to work in in large towns like London or the postman had to work in when delivering the mail in late 19th century cities. So living environments were important, we know that, but we haven't really ever taken account of the type of work uh, as an important factor in influencing health outcomes in the population. And that's what Addressing Health tries to do. So just a quick glance at the future. Um, we hope to transcribe 30,000 records of pensioners like uh, Elizabeth George that I showed you. We have got a current transcription project going on a platform called Zooniverse and we're part of Transcription Tuesday. Uh, who do you think you are Transcription Tuesday tomorrow? If you go on our website you'll get details of that or if you just google Transcription Tuesday you can log in and if you um, log in tomorrow you will see all sorts of pension records from different workers and you can help transcribe those. We put one year up on Zooniverse and we've got three more years, uh, 1860s, for Transcription Tuesday tomorrow. Um, in doing that, you'll be helping us to identify sickness and ill health and help us map it, um, uh, which is something we're very interested in, in doing. Um, we're going to be following about one in ten of those workers through to their death and we're going to be purchasing their death certificates and some of you who've been working on the shared learning project will already be familiar with this part of the um, project and we're going to see whether they lived a long life and if they didn't was that linked to the cause of retirement. Um, and we're going to be using the death certificates for that. And that's another transcription project that will be coming online in the next few weeks. We're also going to be looking at how the workforce responded to sickness. And that is Natasha's work um, for her PhD. And we're going to be finding out much more about the doctors who work for the post office. And there were many hundreds of those doctors um, by the 1890s. Um, who were they? How important was the post office um, for their work? And what difference did their experience make to the diagnosis of ill health? And our second PhD student, Holly Marley, is going to be researching that for her doctorate. Well, that is um, the oldest postmistress in Britain. 
Um, I've introduced you to three pretty feisty characters, I think, um, who lived a long and uh, um, healthy life working for the post office. They were the fortunate few. At the bottom end were those unfortunate many that didn't make it through and didn't survive very long to have a pension. Um, and so with that, um, thank you for listening. I hope I've uh, given you a taste of the project and um, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you ever so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now.